Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright. This is the video teaching series, How to Study the Bible, or How to Study the Bible, Find Jesus, the true Jesus in the Bible. How do you find truth? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. We've been speaking about, the in the last several lessons, the, uh, the, the various principles that are necessary, absolutely unequivocally uh, necessary to be applied when you're studying the Bible. If you violate any of these principles when you're studying the Bible, you will set yourself up for deception. They are invaluable principles from God that the, the Word of God itself teaches. So this is the this is the eighth principle and the final principle that we'll be covering in this video series. Uh, this is uh, video number 20, lesson number 19, and number lesson number 20, the next video, will be will conclude this series. Uh, and it will be a summary of all of this. But let's cover the last principle because this one, this one, um, it not only tell the Bible not only, not only tells you the principle, but it tells you the consequence of violating it. So, the principle is principle number eight, lesson number nineteen. Beware the danger of adding to or taking away from the Word of God. Beware of the danger, John. 21, 25, there are, many, there are also many other things which Jesus did the which. If they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. The Amplified Version says it this way, and there are also many other things which Jesus did. If they should all be recorded one by one in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain, have room for the books that would be written. And then we expanded translation. I'm actually going to read verses 24 and 25 here. This is the disciple who is bearing testimony concerning these things and the one who wrote these things. And we know positively that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things which Jesus did, which are of such a nature that if they were written, each one, I do not suppose that the universe itself could contain the books that would be written. Now, that is some huge, huge statements. <laughs> Those are some huge statements. That's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible because it expands my thinking and lets me know that the Bible I hold in my hands is not limited to what I hold in my hands, but that God has condensed all of this that could be known about him down to this manageable book, even though I cannot possibly ever become an expert on that book. There are no experts Anyone who is an expert on the Bible is a deluded deceiver because there are no experts. All of us are but children, finite-minded children trying to understand an infinite God, his plan, his purposes, his word. So here's the principle. This verse from John, the Gospel of John reveals that the Lord has already done an astounding job of condensing all that could be known and that is required by him for us to know. Therefore, it is the height of presumption and pride and proof of deception to either add to or take away from the word that we do not ha that we do have in our possession from God what we have God gave no more no less what we have is what God requires of us to add to it 
is presumption. To take away from it is foolishness. Because if according to John 21, 25, if everything Jesus did and said was written about in detail, the, the world itself could not contain the books. And I, I like to think of it this way. If the gravitational force of the earth was the ceiling of the library and the ground of planet earth was the floor of that library, this library could not contain all of the books that would have to be written in order to record everything Jesus did and said. You say, well, he was only here 33 years. Say, ah, there we go. There we go. Because Jesus is the word made flesh. And you can't record logos in books. There's too much of it because it is the word of the infinite God. It's the mind of the infinite God. So therefore, when I add to or take away from the word, I'm adding to or taking away from God because the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and is God to us today. Not the book itself. The book's not God. The word is God. And that book contains the word of God. And as I've already said in a previous video, it doesn't say words of God. It's not the words of God. It is the word of God. Even when God chose to record what somebody else said, it's the word of God. He wanted us to know those things. Even when he records things that people did that were wrong, that's a part of the word of God. All of this is evidentiary to us in making our decisions of what we're going to be persuaded to believe and not believe and to have the evidence to make the right choices because choices have consequences. Putting this principle in another simpler or more direct form of expression, we are to speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. We can't not speak what the Bible speaks because that is judgment on us. And we can't speak and say things the Bible does not say because that's adding to the word of God. Now, let, let me give you the verses for this. Uh, there are at least four of them that say it directly. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish from it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And then finally, Deuteronomy, uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 through 20. And here's where it gets really specific, both in describing the attitude and taking away from it and of the consequences of doing either or both of those things. Revelation 22, 18. I, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things... God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the, prof book, uh, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so, Come, Lord Jesus. These are three of the last four verses of the Bible. There's only one more verse, Revelation 22, 21. So Revelation 18, 19, and 20 are three of the last four verses of the Bible. And the Lord took three of the last four verses of the Bible to make this point to you and me. How important is this principle? How important is this principle? That's why going all the way back to the beginning, 
of this series. The Word of God is the final authority in our lives. For that to be true and to be effective, I cannot take out the parts I don't like and ignore them. I cannot add to the Bible the things I think ought to be in there that's not in there. There is a reason why our God, our Father, made the decision to put what he put in there and to leave out the things that he didn't put in there. And over time, and over time, God has moved on a multitude of holy men to decide what books were from God and what books weren't from God. So that today, we have, we have beyond a reasonable doubt the ability to have confidence that the 66 books that we have called the Bible or the library of those books, but see, it's used, it's called the Bible, which is a singular word. Those 66 books make up the book. Some call it the good book. It's the eternal word. The portion of the eternal word the Father wanted us to have. For us then, to take that, for us then to take that and add to it or take away from it. You could say it's foolishness, but it's beyond foolishness. It reveals the heart. No wonder Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is, King James now, is quick or living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why men don't, many men don't like this book. They don't like what it says. I mean, let's face facts. You either believe Jesus is God or you have to believe he's a lunatic. There's no in-between ground. He that believeth on me shall not die, but shall live forever. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow, flow river, live, rivers of living water. John 12, he that rejecteth me, that is, receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in that day. This man is saying the things I've said to you and I'm saying to you are going to be the criteria against which you're going to be judged in the final judgment. That's some strong statements. The Jews had their problem with it. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. That's not even good grammar, is it? I mean, shouldn't he have said, my Father and I are one? Don't you put the other person first to yourself last, grammatically? No, no. He said, I and my Father are one. Because he was trying to demonstrate that he was not just equal to God, he was God. He is God. He's God. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Whoever continues in my word is going to be free. I mean, these statements are not just harmless little statements. They're either true or they're not just false, but they're the ravings of a lunatic. The whole Bible is like that. <laughs> and the prophecy in these books? I mean, can you imagine the prophecy? I believe it was Micah that prophesied there'd be a day when men would run to and fro. And it speaks about the torches on their chariots as they jostle one against another. Or the prophecy that there would be a day there would be a battle that the, the flesh would instantaneously melt off the 
the skeletons of people and that their eyes would melt in their sockets? That's far out stuff, except if you study the effects of being the victim of a nuclear blast and find the places in Hiroshima and Nagasaki where there's nothing but a shadow of a person laying on the concrete where there was nothing left but a shadow, just gone in an instant. You could go on and on and on and on here. Or how about this? They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the Greek Greek word there is not a the word speaking of ex, unintelligible ecstatic utterances. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's a Greek word. The Spirit gives them utterance. That word is to speak at the highest level of erudition, grammatically, and in enunciation. People are going to speak in languages that they don't know, and they're going to speak it at the highest level, grammatically, and in pronunciation. I mean, really, the book is full of this stuff. It's not just believing that Moses held his hand up with a a stick in in it out over the Red Sea and it over the night it parted and that a couple of million people at least walked across the Red Sea on dry ground and when they got to the other side, he gave the signal and the waters crashed back down upon the, the Egyptian army. That's pretty far out. Or how about... The Jews getting up every morning in the wilderness and going out and collecting baskets full of this seed that uh, was called manna. And just like they would with grains of wheat, they would go back to their tents and grind it into flour and make bread out of it. And that's how they ate for 40 years. Can you imagine the nutritional value that that manna had, that they could live off that as their main source of food for 40 years and not be victims of malnutrition? I mean, and that happened every day for 40 years in the wilderness because they were transients and could not plow and grow a crop in the wilderness they could eat from? Really? I'm either going to believe this book or I'm not going to believe it. Those things are either true or they're not true. There's no middle ground. They're not nice stories. They're either true or they're not true. They're either facts or they're not facts. There was either an ark built and a flood or there wasn't one. My dad, who didn't get saved until he was uh, had been out of the Navy for probably almost 10 years, when I, during my sophomore and junior year, freshman and sophomore years of high school, we were living in Rhode Island, and he was stationed there at Quonset Point Naval Air Station, which was a naval air station at the time. It was no longer. And uh, he was a part of uh, VX-6, Air Development Squadron 6. It, was, uh, it did experimental type stuff. And both the winners of my freshman and sophomore years for six, seven months, he was gone to Antarctica. And he was in charge of the uh, mission to photo map from aerial photography the Antarctic continent, which was the first maps ever made of Antarctica. And uh, he told me this himself. He said he was a sinner at the time, but he believed the Bible. And uh He said, I was out on a mission. We'd gone out in a helicopter to an area where, to our knowledge, no human beings had ever been. And uh, we were doing some tests and taking some pictures. And I I was in charge, but I wasn't actually doing the work. And there was a mountain uh, there. And it was a mountain because it was well above all the snowpack. And it was mostly rock strewn with no snow on it. And he said, I walked up to the top of that mountain and I'm standing there and all of a sudden I thought, 
Now, here is a mountain. I doubt seriously any, we don't have any indication any human has ever been on this mountain before. So here I'm standing as the first human being to ever stand on this mountain right here. And if there was a flood all those many years ago, uh, I can should be able to stoop down here and turn over the rocks that are here, and I should be able to find salt deposits up on the top of this mountain underneath these rocks, between the rock and the soil. And he said, Chester, I bent down and I began to turn over rocks, and every rock I turned over had the white deposit of salt. He said, to prove it, I, I took my gloves off and I dipped my finger in it, put it to my tongue, and it was salt. Now, that's what he did to believe. And I'm happy for him, but my experience with God and my confidence in there being a God already knew there had been a flood because I read it. It was in his word. I'm not taking that story out of the Bible because it's hard for some people to believe. I believe it. I'm not going to explain that flood away, that it really was just a flood in that area and it didn't flood the whole world and all mankind would kill like the Bible says. I'm not going to do that either. I'm not going to add to it or take away from it. Now, in another place, the scripture says, talks about in Genesis 1 uh, and and on the first day, first day, first day. And some say, well, that is a 24-hour day. But that's not what the word means, and it's not what the context is saying. And we know that's the case but when, because when we get to, the, to chapter 2, the word isn't day that's used there. It's the generations of the creation of the earth. It's the generations of creation. So there's no evidence, biblical evidence, that those were seven 24-hour days. Uh, the question is not whether or not God could have created it in instantaneously in a 24-hour period. That's not even the question. But he didn't. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. And just the gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Everything God's ever created was perfect in its creation. How did the earth get without form and void? Well, there are verses, and I don't have time in this lesson to go into it. There are verses that explain that. In other places in the Bible, using that exact terminology and those exact Hebrew words, that it was a result of Judgment of God on the earth. Why? Because the adversary was cast out of heaven and sent here. And there was conflict and upheaval. You and I drive an automobile, and that automobile is uh, powered by petroleum, whether gasoline or diesel. And petroleum, in its crude form, comes up out of the earth. And what is petroleum? It's uh, the product of hydrocarbons. And where do hydrocarbons come from? Rotting flesh. And where did all those billions and billions of gallons of rotted flesh come from? Well, apparently, when the earth was created, there were animals on the earth. Animals unlike anything that we've had on the earth since man was formed. And apparently in that upheaval that took place between Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 and 2, uh, those huge animals with all their flesh, and there had to have been multitudes of them, countless numbers of them from our perspective, that got buried up, either alive or dead in all of that upheaval on the earth. And these became the oil reserves and the natural gas reserves uh, that we utilize today. You say, well, the Bible doesn't say that. No, it doesn't. But there is enough stuff in the scripture that leaves that open as an explanation and not a contradiction of the word of God. 
So I'm not adding to the word. I'm saying it appears as though this is the case. But I hadn't made a doctrine out of that. not going to make a doctrine out of that. I can't. Because there are some things he tells us and some things he didn't tell us. So it is a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing in applying the scripture today to take the our application of the scripture in our daily lives. I mean, for instance, you know, you can abuse social media until it becomes a sin to you. But if I say X, Y, Z is a sin to you, I've just added to the word. It's a sin to me if I'm abusing it. The Spirit of God convicts me. But I can't add to the word. Neither can I take things away from the word. Because if I come up with doctrines that are not based, that are based on what I've left out of the word or what I've added to the word, then I'm preaching a lie. I'm, a de- I'm deceived and I've become a deceiver. So if you want truth, truth you can count on, you cannot violate this last principle of interpretation. In Jesus' name, I pray that the reverence and the fear of God would come upon us by the grace of God that we would carefully examine ourselves to to make sure that we have not added to the word or taken away from the word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let it be so. God bless you.